Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 16th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, some propose a zero PFD. Some propose 3,000. We discuss our take on the issue. Second, the projected state revenue numbers are bad, and we are operating without a safety net. We discuss the consequences. And third, why we disagree strongly with the RCA's decision to keep Hillcorp's financials out of public view. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's talk about the weekly top three, and this is a big one. Yesterday, we kind of do- we kind of stole a little bit of your thunder because we dove down into the story uh, from Suzanne Downing over at Must Read Alaska, a column piece um, that uh, talks about uh, that this is the year for no PFD, change my mind. Um, and I will say this, Brad, there was an interesting, uh, Winita Casillas over at Alaska Permanent Fund Defenders said that she had specifically asked Suzanne about this, and Suzanne say uh, said something along the lines of, oh, she was just trying to be provocative. Um, but that's not how I'm reading this. I'm reading this as somebody is floating an idea and uh, trying to test the waters. What, what What's your take on this? Oh, I think that's right, Michael. I, I think it is a trial balloon on behalf of very likely the administration, because that's where Suzanne gets most of her feed from. Um, I wouldn't think it would be, I mean, this, this is, this is in line with what you would expect from Senator Von Imhoff um, and uh, Representative Johnston uh, uh, on the House side, uh, the kind of thinking that you would think they'd be floating, but that's not, that's not Suzanne's usual bent. Her usual bent is coming from the administration. Um, I, I had a thought at one point that it might be coming from Americans for, for Alaskans for Prosperity, Americans for Prosperity, the Alaska chapter, because they've been um, uh, uh, fairly vocal on uh, sacrificing the PFD in order to avoid any sort of other tax. Right, right. Um, and and that may be part of it. That may be. I mean, that may be part of the genesis of. Of, of what's leading the the what would lead the Dunleavy administration to, to float this trial balloon through Suzanne, but um, but I, I agree that it's a trial balloon uh, of some sort. I don't think it's just Suzanne on her own deciding to to post something like this. So we're looking at this piece and reading it, and uh, I mean I got to be honest, there are all kinds of problems uh, in this uh, in this piece. I, I will say that the biggest one for me though is that she goes throughout she talks about the three the three legs of the Alaska economy you know she talks about oil revenue she talks about tourism she talks about fishing she talks about the impact she talks about this is not the time to be spending government money on people but nowhere in here not not a single sentence uh, dot or tittle in this entire article talks about the impact the economic impact of sucking another 700 million dollars out of the private economy on top of the other 700 million dollars that they're draw, they're they're already saying that they're going to draw out of the economy there's not a single talking point here that addresses that issue which to me in a time when we were already facing a recession before all the coronavirus stuff and everything else um, is irresponsible, really. I mean, quite honestly. Yeah, it was. I mean, the 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 stark irony yesterday of seeing Suzanne's article on, on one side and then seeing uh, pieces come out of D.C. at a national level talking about putting $1,000 uh, 
uh, into people's hands as one of the stimulus response or as one of the federal responses to the coronavirus. It was just stark. I mean, why would the Fed say that? Why would Mitt Romney, of all people, fiscal conservative Mitt Romney, go out in front uh, talking about doing something like that? Because of the economic impact. Because of the economic impact of putting money into the hands, particularly of middle and lower income uh, Americans, uh, they spend that money. Um, uh, it's the, the the propensity of spend, which is what economists call it, uh, among middle and lower income families is huge. And so why would you at a federal level think about that as a first line, uh, first line of stimulus to get the economy uh, restarted once we once we get through the current situation or to tide us over uh, through the current situation. You do that because of the economic impact of putting money in people's hands. Um, and, and the stark contrast between that at the federal level and all of the economists that that I follow and talk with and, and, and keep track of at the federal level supporting that, the stark contrast between that and Suzanne's article and stuff from Natasha and Bryce and Jennifer Johnston uh, about, oh, we need to cut back on, on putting money in people's hands in Alaska just was just was huge. I mean, it's th there is no better proof, no better proof of, of the economic impact of the importance of getting money in people's hands. Um, and, the, and the economic impact of getting money in, people, money in people's hands than the immediate snap response that we're having in D.C. among economists and among serious politicians, uh, policy uh, politicians uh, that, are, that, are, that are focusing on that as, as a first line of defense against, uh, against the recession and possibly, possibly depression that we're, that we're facing. And it's it, – it, I just I, – I mean, so we have lost – we have lost – any sort of common sense in Alaska about our economy in this drive to avoid taxing the top 20%. Um, th this, this effort by the top 20% to dodge contribute themselves contributing to the cost of government by pushing it down on middle and lower income Alaska families through, uh, uh, through PFD cuts, it's just gotten out of hand. I mean, we, we're, we're right. losing, we're losing any sort of, of economic, economic, uh, 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 thinking or economic analysis as we go through this. And it's just, it's stark self um, uh, preservation. I mean, right. it's stark self, 20% uh, uh, looking out for themselves, selfishness, uh, looking out for themselves and saying, oh, we don't want to be taxed. Um, and so let's just tax middle and lower income Alaska families by taking the money out of them. It's just, well, it, 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 it's infuriating to, to, to how, how we've how we've evolved into that. Well, especially in light of what's coming down now. I mean, we're talking about a minimum of kind of a 15 day furlough for many people, many of whom are hourly, uh, can't afford, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. And they're about to take a two week enforced vacation. Uh, some with no pay, some with pay. Those of us, those you know, those that are lucky enough to get it. Some of us no pay, and uh, you know, it, it's it, it to think that now is the time that they're going to talk about sucking that little bright spot out of the horizon, maybe in October, knowing that they're going to be getting a little money, uh, is just astonishing. And the fact that they're again not just Suzanne Downing in this piece, but most news reporting on this is not talking about the economic impact of taking that money away. They talk about it in abstract terms as if if they just suck it out and put it in, put, and give, keep it for the government, that everything will just be fine. There's no discussion on what that impact is. And as ISA reported, again, the largest economic impact on Alaska families uh, on top of now the new corona thing and all the I mean, this is it's just astonishing. It is, and when the and when the news media talk about it, when they talk about the economic impact, they they the few times they will do that, they'll talk about the economic impact of taxes uh, on on the top twenty percent. Uh, I mean, there's a quote that that Nat Hertz when he was back with the uh, ADN uh, had of Natasha saying, "Oh, you can't you can't tax the top twenty percent; they'll leave." I mean, it's just that that's the that's the type of thinking that we've got in Alaska. That's what we've devolved into. We've devolved into a top twenty percent centric. Look out for me. I don't care about anybody else. 
um, uh, let me keep all of my income. I don't want to contribute to government. Let that be the, the burden of the middle and lower income Alaska families. It, that's what we've devolved into. That's our economics is how do we protect the top 20 percent against paying taxes? It's outrageous. Right. I mean, I, I I told you when uh, when I was giving you the top three that you might need the delay button for my converse, <laughs> for my conversation about Suzanne's piece because it's just it's just outrageous. Right. We 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 have a government and now we have, you know, if this if this is a a, a trial balloon for the administration, it's just outrageous. It's a trial balloon to protect the top twenty percent. How do we how do we how do we go to the max? Right. Uh, take the PFD entirely away to protect the top twenty percent. The money shot in this whole article again is, and I and I, I kind of sussed this out yesterday, and I'll get your take on it, is the final paragraph. The final paragraph is, it's not healthy for citizens to receive $3,000 from their government each and every year. That's the beginning sentence. And to me, that immediately shows me that, well, somebody's bought into the ideal that this is all government money, that this is not the people's money, that after the government has taken 100% of the severance, 100% of the corporate taxes, 100% of the infrastructure tax, 75% of the royalties, and a good chunk of the earnings of the royalties of that additional 25%, somehow that extra little money is still government money and that it essentially is welfare. She goes on, of course, to talk about redistribution, income redistribution of socialism, which again is, is you know, almost exactly what we heard from people like Pete Kelly, uh, Natasha, uh, so on and so forth. I mean, this is, this is, it, it, it's insulting, quite honestly. I read that and I got so angry the first time I read it. Uh, I'm over it now, but I just thought how, how, um, just arrogance. insulting arrogance. arrogance yeah arrogant that's exactly what it is it's just condescending that we don't need that money and again not a single word as to what it does to the economy yeah it's um uh it's just i mean so so let's go to oklahoma just for a second let's put our minds in oklahoma for a second what what do you think the reaction would be if we said if the government said to oklahomans you don't need those royalty checks from from the oil industry uh, on 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 production from your land, just give that over to government uh, uh, because you know you really don't need it, and, and it's not it's not really yours. It's coming from underground. God God put it there. It's really the state's. You didn't earn that, and, right? And and, uh, and so let's just give that over to government. That's exactly what we're doing here. the The PFD is Alaska's form of royalty. Uh, it's the way of distributing the revenues uh, owned to the landowner. Uh, and we all own the, uh, we all have the mineral interests in common up here. Is the way of distributing the the, the the revenue under the landowner in a situation where the federal government protect it, pre, uh, prevents us from from separating the, the mineral state into into private estates, uh, individual estates. So it's it's just our royalty. No one in Oklahoma would say, well, yeah, your royalty. Let's just give it to the state. Yet that's exactly what's going on up here. You want to talk about socialist? Right. That's that's the socialist approach to say, take your royalty income, take the individual royalty income and give it to the state. It becomes the state's. Right. That is the socialism in all of this. Well, and the protectionism of a state that spends twelve thousand dollars for every man, woman and child to say we can't deliver. There's a phrase in here talking about. Uh, basic government services or something. And I'm like, if he, if you're not delivering basic government services for less than twice what the national average is, we have a serious problem. Yeah. Well, we're going to, we're going to, yeah, we're going to confront a situation where the legislature is going to produce a very low PFD. I mean, they're, they're going to yeah. protect government, government spending. They're not going to go into the ERA uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, supplemental funds. Uh, and they're gonna they're gonna take it entirely out of middle and lower income Alaska families through through PFD cuts, um, and and that's going to go to the administration. That's going to be the budget that goes to the administration. I, there's going to be a real test for Governor Dunleavy about whether he's prepared to walk the talk he's made about protecting the PFD. If it were me, I would I would consider very seriously vetoing the budget, the entire budget, sending it back and saying refinance it in a way that preserves the PFD. Well, um, and there's a and, por there's a chance of doing this because there is money still in the ERA that does not belong there. There's still two years worth of PFD cuts that are sitting in the ERA that technically do not belong there. You could utilize a portion of that to pay a full PFD this year. 
Yeah, you and I might disagree on that, but 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 there's there are ways that you can that you can finance uh, uh, the the budget. I mean, you have to cut a part of the budget, but there are ways to finance the budget. So if if this is a trial balloon by the administration um, about going to a zero PFD or a near zero PFD and seeing what the reaction would be, uh, if that's what the legislature gives them, um, then okay uh, you're you're getting you're getting our reaction our reaction is that's outrageous it's the worst thing economically you can do to alaska you're 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 doing the large thing that has the largest adverse effect on middle and lower income alaska families and governor if you sign that budget we'll know where you stand now right well, um you, you you stand right right there with kevin meyer uh and 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 Kathy Giesel and Jennifer Johnson and Natasha von Imhoff. And, and I don't think that's a place he wants to stand, but that's where he will be uh, if that's where, if that, if, if this is where we end up. All right. Well, uh, that's number one of the weekly top three. Brad and I are going to fight in the break here over the ERA. Th- and Brad says he's going to disagree with me on this. So I got to know why, because technically I'm right. I know that you're hesitant to draw more from the ERA simply for the earnings potential in the future, but Technically, I'm right. The money that was cut out of the PFDs has remained of two of the three years, uh, remained in the PF in the earnings reserve account. Uh, I mean, so if you wanted to talk about a technicality, that money still is owed to Alaskans, and it still sits there. Am I wrong? Well, so what happened in those years is the money did that money did stay in the ERA, but we we drew more out of the CBR. Um, and so on a net basis, we took money out of the state's uh, savings. Yes, technically it stayed inside the bounds of the account we call the earnings reserve account, but we did drain that money, uh, the equivalent of that money, out of the CBR uh, to pay for government. Um, and frankly, I view, uh, and I've had this debate with a lot of people, probably including you in the past, <laughs> I, I view uh, those those uh, uh, withholdings, if you will, from the PFD as being taxes, as being as being an effort to withhold money that offset the, the money that was being paid out of the CBR to keep that money um, uh, in the state uh, and to and to in essence through the trade off between the CBR and the ERA uh, to use taxes to pay for a portion uh, horrible taxes, largest adverse impact taxes. Uh, taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families, but to use taxes to to, to pay that money out. So it's I I mean that's really a, a very esoteric uh, uh, disagreement um, uh, about how you characterize uh, those two years. But I characterize them as taxes and and think that uh, it was just the the first two years of taxes on lower and middle income Alaska families to help finance government. Well, I'm mad about that, Brad. I'm totally mad and I'm frustrated with you. So you can tell. I'm just, you know, I mean, it is a tax. There's no doubt about it. It's a tax. The money is available. I, I just wish that we could. Uh, I, I just wish that we could find some way to wake these people up to it. Uh, Charlie uh, in the chat room says, uh, uh, "Why has Brad given up on cutting the cost of government?" And uh, I mean, I think that's a misreading of the situation, but I'd like you to be able to address it. So why have you given up on cutting the cost of government, uh, uh, Brad? Well, it's very simple. We couldn't get 16 last year to support the governor's uh, 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 cuts. The governor came in with with a, a budget that had a three billion, uh, a three in front of the number um, and had uh, massive cuts to, to, to align uh, government spending with revenues to more closely align government spending uh, with revenues. He proposed that budget. It got trashed. Um, and when the and when the governor came to the first round of vetoes and and went to do nose counting on how deep he could go uh, uh, to support uh, and get support of 16 as he would need in the legislature to get that first round of vetoes, he he couldn't get 16 to support that round of vetoes. He ended up with a vetoing some but vetoing down to a uh, vetoing down to a level that, that had a four in front of it had a, had a four billion number in front of it um, and so he the, the the support just wasn't there and even that round of vetoes the first round of vetoes essentially got reversed um, uh, by the legislature not I mean the the vetoes got upheld but then the legislature passed another appropriations bill that effectively reversed some of those vetoes and the governor came back with a second round of vetoes that didn't even go back down to the first round of vetoes 
uh, came down to again after counting noses, uh, came down to came down to the second round of vetoes. And you had legislators. I mean, I, my favorite my favorite example is the uh, uh, is the um, uh, Council for the Arts, right? Um, the governor had 700. The the original vetoes vetoed out. Or the original budget vetoed out the entire, uh, reduced the entire seven hundred fifty thousand for the arts. Um, when we got to the first round of vetoes, uh, uh, the governor uh, vetoed those out. When we got to the second round of vetoes, and and we did and we did nose counting, uh, there were even Republicans who pushed back on that and said, "Oh no, you got to put that seven hundred fifty thousand dollars back in the budget." Council for the arts, arts are important, but they can be privately supported. We don't need them supported by the state, um, and so even Republicans push back on that. There, there's a there's a bill in the legislature this year that's made it uh, that's making its way through the Senate, uh, supported by a Valley Republican senator uh, by the name of David Wilson that expands Medicaid, uh, expands Medicaid to include an additional category of of providers that that are authorized to provide. Uh, Medicaid services, right? Uh, and so you, I'm, I haven't given up on on cutting. I, you and I can go through the budget, and we can get it down to to, to the level of revenues. Big cuts to the university, big cuts to Medicaid, uh, cuts to K through 12, and we can get it down to the to the level of revenues. But you can't get that through the legislature. So why keep talking? Why keep banging your head <laughs> on 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 an issue that you can't even get sixteen legislators? You can't even get the core our legislators to support. All right, Brad Keithley. He's not passionate about this at all, folks. We just finished the top one, and now we're going on to number two, uh, which talks about this price war, the price war for oil between Saudi Arabia and Russia. And uh, what is it going to do to Alaskan budgets? Uh, you know, raw numbers, it doesn't look good. I mean, on the uh, just on the raw numbers, it uh, could almost potentially double the deficit. But there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of particulars in here that make it uh, make it a little bit different than that. But it does mean big deficits continue for the state of Alaska, Brad. Yeah, uh, there was a presentation by um, Legislative Finance Division. Uh, last week to the legislature on on Wednesday of last week, there's an article about it uh, in um, uh, the Alaska Journal of Commerce, and I think it got picked up by the ADN as well uh, about that hearing. Uh, the articles by Elwood Bremer for people who want to catch up with it. Um, an important hearing uh, about where we're headed from a from a revenue standpoint uh, in a $40 uh, oil world. You and I talked a couple of weeks ago, last week, somewhere along in here. About whether the forty dollar world, forty dollar a barrel world, is is durable, whether it continues beyond uh, the virus, and um, and I think it is. I think it. I think there's a real risk that we're that we that we've shifted the paradigm of oil down into a, a new uh, 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 paradigm, and and there's there's analysts who are out there who are talking about this that agree with that with that issue. A forty dollar a barrel oil world looks a heck of a lot different. Uh, than the world that got projected uh, back in the fall uh, when DOR did its fall revenue forecast. Um, you and I have talked on the show uh, on about what the 10-year uh, plan looks like uh, put out by the administration in December based upon that revenue forecast. And the 10-year plan, and, and Mayor Pierce, who's evidently listening, will remember this when I, when I discussed it with the Kenai Peninsula Borough. Um, the 10-year uh, the plan uh, showed a an average deficit uh, over the over the 10 years uh, from now to 2030 showed an average deficit of about 1.8 billion dollars a year huge deficit huge deficit and that's assuming we cap spending uh, at current levels plus only inflation uh, going forward so b big deficit uh, under even the the administration's own 10-year plan the uh, numbers presented last week by uh, uh, legislative finance revised those projections uh, using uh, a $40 a barrel uh, world, uh, assuming $40 oil as opposed to uh, uh, as opposed to the prices that are in the the Department of Revenue's fall uh, forecast, and that $1.8 billion average annual deficit uh, grows to 2.5 billion dollars 
average annual deficit over the next 10 years if uh, oil stays at <laughs> at uh, forty dollars we're talking about 700 million dollar difference and that's not accounting for that's just oil that's not right. accounting for the potential drop in in uh, permanent fund revenues uh, both to the state and to uh, citizens that that's that may result from uh, the uh, stock market drops that's that 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 Seven hundred million dollar increase in in average annual deficit doesn't ca- doesn't account for the potential uh, stock market impacts. Uh, the revenues from oil drop from two billion dollars uh, down to one point three billion dollars, one point four billion dollars, right? Uh, average over the ten year period. So, it's I mean we're we're <laughs> we, we it's been bad up until now, um, and and we've 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 been confronting a very bad situation going forward it's it has gotten exponentially worse uh, uh, as a re- if we're if we're shifting into a forty dollar a barrel regime um, I understand the Department of Revenue has delayed the spring revenue forecast right uh, as as they're trying to roll through the effect of these numbers in the revenue forecast um, and so there may be some fine tuning around this but but uh, legislative finances presentation was based upon some scenarios that revenue had ran uh, back in the fall when they were doing their price forecast, and and they did various scenarios that assumed higher oil prices and lower oil prices, and they based uh, based their uh, their presentation last Wednesday on uh, on those, and that's what these numbers are based on. So it's uh, we're we're just facing we're facing a, a, a an almost unfathomable. Uh, a fiscal crisis uh, over the next 10 years and and the and and the and the takeaway from that is do we need to cut spending yes we need to cut spending uh but we're going to need to raise revenues in some fashion and and we're going to need to raise revenues through taxes and it's really a question of who's going to pay those taxes pfd cuts the, the the use the taxing through pfd cuts it's middle and lower income alaska families uh, and 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 barely scrapes the top 20 percent and takes nothing from uh, from non-residents earning a Ala- earning income in Alaska. So it, it, we're we're going to have to confront that issue. The legislature keeps putting it off. I mean, my favorite comment this year was, "Oh, we're going to have to cut the PFD to zero because it's too late to do taxes." Well, if you would have done it last year, <laughs> right? <laughs> when we were talking about it, we, it wouldn't be too late. I mean, every year we put this off is a year that we're just setting up for another set of PFD cuts. Um, but the point is the numbers are just huge. I mean, right. the, the, the deficit, um, uh, the projected deficit of $2.5 billion is half the budget. It's now 50%. The budget's now 50% in deficit. Even if we cut the budget 25%, even if we cut it a third, um, which the governor tried to do and which there weren't 16 legislators to support, uh, but even if we try to cut it uh, uh, by a third, um, uh, taking the drastic steps, steps that would require, we're still not offsetting the deficit. So there will be taxes. The question simply is who's going to pay those taxes. Right. And, and and I think the takeaway from this whole thing is is that this legislature, previous legislatures, have all ignored the warning signs that the bridge is out and that we're racing towards the uh, towards the, 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 the chasm. But... Uh, you know, hey, don't worry about it. We'll take care of that one next year. Um, and, and, and up until now, we've had a safety net up, uh, underneath us, right? I mean, from from 2013 to to when this when the deficit started to uh, to basically this fiscal year, we've always had the SBR, the statutory budget reserve initially, and the constitutional budget reserve on top of that, about 17 billion dollars as a safety net underneath us, and we go. You know, so we walk out on the high wire and we go, well, you know, <laughs> there there isn't enough money at the end. There isn't enough wire to get us there. So we can fall off and we'll fall into the safety net. And we'll use the safety net uh, another year. We've used up the safety net. The five right. billion dollars in the in the statutory budget reserve is long gone. Constitutional budget reserve is now started out at 12. It's now less than than two. Uh, after we do the supplementals, which also are impacted by low oil prices, low oil prices. After we do the FY20 supplementals, will be probably less than one billion left in the uh, in the constitutional budget reserve. The safety net's gone. We we are out there 
on the on the high wire over the Grand Canyon. Right. Nothing between us. I think the most amazing thing on this was in the article in the Journal of Commerce. There was a comment. The comment was, "We need to do away with the dividend unless there's money available to pay it, without putting us in the red." It is the most basic common sense not to spend your reserves unnecessarily. And I just thought. Wow, there is some deep, deep irony and blindness in that comment right there. I mean, seriously, they've spent the reserve unnecessarily for years, and now all of a sudden it's our problem. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they they bought into Natasha's uh, it's government money. We can use the PFD as a reserve. Uh, uh, it's you know if we if we pay a dividend, it's at our discretion. You know, we're a corporate board. Uh, we can decide whether to pay. It's just I'm, they bought into Natasha. They bought yeah. into the top 20 percent. Absolutely. I'm just scrolling backwards here. A couple of the comments. Uh, Andy says, so when 50 percent of the people live paycheck to paycheck, you want to tax them. Now, Brad doesn't want to tax them. But Brad is talking about this is the legislature and this is kind of the inevitability of what we're talking about. He goes, they are they, they are being taxed. Right. EFD cuts are a tax. Right. They want to tax them more is essentially what Brad is saying. I mean, you're going to be taxed more when you have a 50% deficit on a $5 billion budget. There is no other option. I mean, there's no there's no more piggy banks. You've smashed all the piggy banks and there are no more money. There's no more money in the couch cushions. You can't go find it. It's done at that point. You're going to you know, you not only are you being taxed now, you're going to be taxed more in the future simply because that is arithmetic at this point. Absolutely, absolutely right. I mean, that's just kind of how it is. Um, what per, what was the percentage of working Alaskans available to tax before COVID? Now people are losing their jobs. Who's left to tax? That's a valid point. But it, but it's not, Michael. I mean, under a flat tax, I, I, there, there. What people are missing is is doing doing a flat tax is is contingent on restoring the PFD restoring at least to, to 50 50 POMV. So everybody's going to have income. Everybody's going to have PFD income and everybody ought to pay a tax. The Alaska constitution has a provision that says people have a corresponding obligation to the people in the state uh, uh, as, as Alaska citizens, everybody ought to pay a tax. It's not just a tax on working people. It's not, it's not just, we're not just replicating the federal income tax system. We're developing a, a tax system that, that reflects uh, Alaska. And so everybody's going to pay a tax. It's not a question of uh, just like just like middle and lower every middle and lower income Alaska family is paying a tax right now through PFD cuts. Everybody will contribute, but they'll contribute less because we'll spread it more broadly. We'll spread it to include the top twenty percent, and we'll spread it to include non-residents. Right. Uh, down to the last two and a half, three minutes here. So we got a quick hit on number three, which is the state allowing Hill Corp to keep their finances from public view. You say this is a problem. Some others say that, you know, it's it, it shouldn't be a big deal, private, blah, blah, blah. Why why is this a problem in two minutes or less? Well, uh, so the, the issue is Hill Corp is asking for permission from the Regulatory Commission of Alaska to acquire BP's interest in TAPS. Uh, at the same time, they're asking the Department of, of, uh, of Natural Resources for approval to acquire BP's interests in the upstream assets in Prudhoe um, and, um, and and the other fields on the North Slope that, that BP has has had an ownership interest in. Uh, the question is, what is Bill? Uh, what does Hillcorp have to show publicly? In all of our past acquisitions, BP of Arco, Conoco Phillips of of BP. Um, we've, we, they, they've been done by public companies. So we've been able to see the public company financials and, and judge whether those are strong companies as a sort of as a, as a crowdsourcing issue. The question has been whether the, the parent's going to guarantee. And in all the past cases, the parent has guaranteed the obligations of the subsidiary as part of those transactions with Hillcorp, they're trying to hide the financials. Hillcorp doesn't want to disclose the financials. So the, we, we have no public method and these are public assets. I mean, Prudhoe is a public asset. Uh, TAPS is a public asset. They are they they are vital to the interests uh, of the state of Alaska. It's a public asset. Prudhoe is a public asset because of the leases. TAPS is a public asset because it sits on state right of way, uh, in part. And it, and and they're public assets. So we need to be as a public. We need to be able to assess the viability of the of the company that's 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 buying those assets we need to be comfortable with it and hillcorp hiding the financials um i think and the rca allowing them to hide the financials is very troublesome particularly 
as we go into a world of $40 oil and oil companies that we thought were viable before aren't going to be viable now. I guess that's the big thing here, Brad. I mean, I'm torn on this because, you know, uh, as a laissez-faire kind of capitalist, uh, you know, free market libertarian, it's like, well, they, 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 you know, it's private information. They're not a publicly traded company. They should be able to do it. Your argument is they're taking on a lot of Alaska's uh, you know, wherewithal with this, their, you know, their financial ability to produce financially and that that should be part of the public. I mean, should it, instead of being out there in public, should they commission a board to be able to review this? Should there be a special commission to view the private books or, I mean, you know. Well, the the RCA is getting access. I mean, this is, this is a question about whether there's public access to this information. The RCA is going to be able to get access to this information. But let me tell you something based on, on 35, 40 years of, of being an oil and gas lawyer, I know there's a huge difference between how people react to things when you're able to keep it confidential in front of a commission and sort of able to, to use your, your political and legal and legislative skill to sort of you know guide the commission in a certain direction and the reaction you have when information is public and you can sort of have a, have a crowdsourcing uh, look at that information and sort of an assessment, uh, uh, both through the press and and by uh, study groups and by talking to uh, analysts, financial analysts, um, have a public assessment, if you will, of that of that information. And what the RCA is doing here is keeping it private. They're going to they're going to assess it themselves. And and like you and I have trouble uh, with uh, with uh, just you know, giving our PFD over to 60 people down in Juneau, really 21 plus 11, so 32 people down in Juneau to decide how they're going to spend our PFD, uh, our royalty payments. Just like you and I have trouble with that, I have trouble with giving over this confidential information and just trusting five people on the on the RCA or three to three to two, so three on the on the RCA to to assess it uh, in private. This is the type of information. It's fundamental information. I mean. Essentially, Hillcorp's claiming that the way they finance things um, and the way they they put together their balance sheet um, is is gives them a competitive advantage. I, I've actually never heard anybody claim that before in my thirty five to in my thirty five years of practicing oil and gas law. I never heard anybody claim that, uh, but now they're claiming it, and the RCA's bought off on it, um, and and they're going to keep the the way in which Hillcorp finances its operations uh, private. It, you, you, you know, I can read, I can go online and read, you know, 20 companies that are in trouble uh, around um, uh, as a result of uh, as a result of the drop in oil prices, 20 oil and gas companies, 25, 30, 50 that are in trouble as a result of the drop in oil prices. BP is not one of them. Um, Hillcourt might be. But I can't tell that, right? Uh, because we don't we don't have the financial information. Right. And and this is all about allowing the transfer from BP to Hillcorp of assets that are vital to the Alaska economy. Um, and, and so I think that I think that information needs to be in the public. I think we all need to be able to assess it. We all need to be able to be part of the process of of sort of collectively, you know, signing off on on uh, on, on this transfer of key Alaska assets to a company that that we don't know that much about. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Brad, anything you're going to be looking at here? Got less about a minute or so. Uh, anything people should be watching? Things you're looking for? What uh, what's your what's your advice to people here for their next 14 days of enforced vacation? Well, I think the focus should be on the PFD and how how the how the legislature is treating the PFD, what they're saying about the PFD, and and more importantly, how the administration treats the PFD. If the administration rolls over on a near near zero PFD, then we're, we're going to be a much different Alaska going forward than we've been in the past. Uh, we're going to be a much more top driven, top 20% controlled state, even than we've been uh, in the past. There, there needs to be somebody standing up for middle and lower income Alaska families. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us today. Michael, as always, thank you for having me. Uh, as always, a pleasure. And, uh, and a headache all at the same time. Thank you so much, my friend. Stay safe. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. 
and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keith, Lake Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.